This episode is brought to you by Libro FM, the first and only company that lets you purchase audiobooks directly from your favorite local bookstore. Ours is the Reading Rock Books in Dixon, Tennessee. You can pick from more than 150,000 audiobooks, including bestsellers and recommendations from booksellers. You'll get the same audiobooks at the same price as the largest audiobook company out there. You know the name. But you'll be part of a different story, one that supports the community. If you're new to audiobooks, they're the perfect way to get more books into your busy life. Listen during your commute, while doing chores, walking the dogs, or just relaxing at home. All you need is a smartphone and the free Libro FM app. If you already love audiobooks and don't know what to listen to next, check out recommendations and curated lists from the people who know audiobooks best, booksellers. The Good Old Days has a special offer for you. Get two audiobooks for the price of one with your first month of membership using the code OLDDAYS, all one word, O-L-D-D-A-Y-S, Old Days. There's also a special offer until the end of 2020 for the holidays. When you buy a 12-month Libro FM gift membership, either for yourself or for someone else, half of that will go directly to the bookstore of your choice. The offer is only valid for new members in Canada and the U.S. Now on to our show. This episode may not be suitable for all listeners. It contains discussions of rape and sexual assault. Listener discretion is advised. Artemisia Gentileschi is often heralded as one of the greatest artists of the 17th century. In a career that spanned four decades, Artemisia's paintings depicted graphic images of feminine power and often showcased female subjects beheading men who violated them. Modern scholars theorize that a personal experience in Artemisia's life shaped her subject matter in a very specific way. While a teenager living and working as a painter in her father's house, she was raped by one of his associates. Her father brought charges against him, and a seven-month trial ensued that included embarrassment, public scandal, and judicial torture. The outcome of the trial ultimately went in Artemisia's favor, but the perpetrator's punishment was flimsy at best. In this episode, we're going to tell you the story about the short but impactful period of Artemisia's life that may give us insight into what justice for a rape victim looked like in Renaissance-era Italy. This is the story of Artemisia Gentileschi. And we are live! This is The Good Old Days, the podcast at the corner of history and true crime. I am Maggie Coomer. And I'm Jasmine Brand. And welcome back! Today we are talking about Artemisia Gentileschi. Every every translation thing that we listen to is like very heavily, like heavy Italian accent. Artemisia Gentileschi. So a lot of the words that I'm going to pronounce today are going to sound sound like that. I am not intending to make fun of anybody, but it's like the only way I can say it correctly. So <laughs> I'm just going to mispronounce everything. So Sorry. I'm, just- <laughs> I'm going to sound like Mario. <laughs> Uh, so this is a this is a particular story that we've been kicking around for a while. It's been on our to do list for like months, I think several months actually. Yeah, it's been on there for a while. Yeah, you sent me. I think you sent me Artemisia's one of Artemisia's uh, portraits depicting Judith beheading Horo Holofernes. Holofernes. Holy wait, no, Holofernes. <laughs> That's Holofernes. not even an Italian name. Holofernes. I don't know. Anyway, say it. Say it again. Hollow furnace. So Judith beheading. The, Judith. So is the title of the painting Judith beheads Hollow furnace? I think it's Judith beheading. Hold on. Judith slaying Hollow furnace is Artemisia. So this is this is a really good point. So there are several paintings called Judith beheading Hollow furnace. Artemisia Gentileschi's painting is Judith slaying Hollow furnace. And she is known to have one of the more graphic depictions of this story. I think we need to talk a little bit about the research that we did, right? So I have, uh, I, I've, I used a, an article called The Trials of Artemisia Gentileschi, Rape as a History by Elizabeth S. Cohen. And she is a professor at York University in Canada. And she wrote this in, it was a, a piece written in 2000 for a, um, 
a journal known as the 16th Century Journal. So I relied heavily on that because she did a great job. Uh, well, all of the primary sources for this are in 17th century Italian, which I do not read. I don't read current Italian. I, mean, I can't do that. No. So um, we relied heavily on secondary sources. We relied solely on secondary sources because we couldn't, we can't interpret those those trial transcripts. Um, but she did a really great job of, of, of translating the trial transcripts, of translating documents from the actual time that we're discussing, which is about 1610, 1611. And uh, yeah, really great job. Love that. Post it in the show notes or, you know, you can always find our source list at thegoodolddayspod.com. What did you rely on? So I used some sources that talked more about her art as a whole, um, including one. And this is a really long title, um, but it was by Sheila Barker. And it was called The First Biography of Artemisia Gentileschi, Self-Fashioning and the Proto-Feminism and Proto-Feminist Art History in Cristofano Bronzini's Notes on Women Artists. Oh, my God. (laughs) And basically, um, this omits, like, whoever Cristofano Bronzini was, he completely leaves out all mentions of rape, sexual assault, like, just skims over. She had a wonderful childhood, and then she started painting. Um, So it is basically talking about, like, this omission and why that would have happened Mm -hmm. and how it then influenced her art. So we need a little background information. Jasmine, can you tell us about what it was like for a Renaissance era woman in Italy around 1610, 1611? Absolutely. So first of all, Artemisia is a little bit of an exception because women didn't tend to be painters. Now, there were quite a few women painters saying that. They tended to, though, be nuns, part of the aristocracy, or, like Artemisia, they had close family members who were painters and kind of incorporated them into their studios and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Now, women in general, um, during this time period, as we're looking at Renaissance and early modern Europe, have heavy gender norm expectations placed upon them. So exactly the kind of things you're thinking of, the kind of things we've talked about before on this show. So women as wife and mother, nun or sex worker. Mm -hmm. And this is even more so where our story is taking place in Rome, because, well, it's the center of the Catholic Church. So there is this added expectation almost that the ideal is the Virgin Mary. And that is a really heavy, heavily pronounced ideal. You see that everywhere. Still, obviously, in Rome, there's all of this imagery. But no woman can achieve Virgin Mary status because each and every one of us still today live in the shadow of Eve's sin. That is an incredible burden. Incredible burden, especially on someone like Artemisia, who doesn't really have any rights anyway living in the time period she's living in, as we'll see as the story progresses. And she's also, like all women in this time period, assumed to be physically inferior, unstable, emotional, and timid, which she proves not to be. Mm -hmm. Also, the beauty standards for this time. I mean, when you think of Renaissance paintings, what is the first thing that you tend to think of? A plump, naked woman. And that's been a meme going around even today. Like, I now, now being in 2020 and living in... I've achieved Renaissance (laughs) painting body. Which I've always been. But But this is the standard of beauty at the time. The the curviness or the heavier woman was best for child rearing. Like, she's probably going to survive a couple of childbirths at least. So you don't have to worry about her as much. Also, being heavier meant that she was probably healthier and wealthier. Boom. She's eating all the good stuff. Exactly. So this is the ideal beauty standard. And it wasn't for pro-feminist reasons. It's because she can have a lot of kids and she might have a little bit more money behind her, which means a higher dowry and all of the things that roll into that. But who is portraying and reinforcing these stereotypes or these ideal standards? Well, most of the artists, of course, are men. And they're going to be the ones portraying this. And in fact, speaking of men, one of the 
I would say, more well-known names coming out of this time period. And this is, granted, about 100 years before, but associated with Renaissance thinking is Machiavelli. You've probably heard of The Prince, comes out in 1513. And this way of thinking is still present in early 1600s Italy. I plucked out a quote to kind of give you an idea. To sum up the time period. Sum up the time period, give you... Context? Give you, give you context in their own words. Sure. So it reads, Fortune is a woman, and if you wish to keep her under, it is necessary to beat and ill-use her. And it is seen she allows herself to be mastered by the adventurous, rather by those who go to work more coldly. She is therefore always womanlike, a lover of young men, because they are less cautious, more violent, and with more audacity to command her. Sounds like a good time. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. Now, also, it mentions coldness and science, quote unquote, plays into this a little bit, at least in the ways that they're viewing men and women at this time, because mm -hmm. this is the time period when they believed that you had four humors in your body mm -hmm. and that controlled everything. All the humors. All the humors. And uh, women were dictated by the wet and cold or negative humors and therefore were just sickly and emotional and just not to be trusted. Now, as far as women artists goes, getting into Artemisia, like I said, there weren't many women who had the opportunity to pursue that in life because they would be expected at some point to become wives and mothers. So even if they had, they might have had a, a short-lived career or they might be lucky enough to go off to an nunnery and hone their craft that way. So we don't actually know how many women artists there were during this time period. And part of that comes in the study of art history. The study was developed, of course, by men who were going to overlook women and even attributed some of the major works to men when they were in fact done by their female mm -hmm. contemporaries. Oh, yeah, that's great. I love that. So... <laughs> so not only are they being overlooked in their own time, they're being overlooked by the study of it hundreds of years later. Yeah. For men, by men. Exactly. Until the end of time. Exactly. <laughs> it's all because of fucking Eve, man. She just, I mean, Eve, she tainted us, didn't she? Yeah, she messed it all up. I have a lot to say on that. I'm not going to right now. You're like, <laughs> but yes. So that is that is the viewpoint that is being taken right now. Never mind all of the other women in the Bible. Mm -hmm. who, yeah. Anyway, um, <laughs> also women were often because they were only seen as these wives and mothers were often excluded from formal education, and these painting studios they weren't always as bohemian and forward thinking as we like to imagine them as being a lot of times they were very serious places of learned men and they were they were hard to get into it was mm -hmm. like an exclusive club especially if you went to work with any of the masters mm -hmm. and so if you didn't have an education you weren't going to get in and if women aren't given an education they're not going to get in so the the deck is definitely stacked against a woman from being able to obtain the, the space needed to become a master artist. Right? Absolutely. Okay. So a lot of the women we're seeing in this time were naturally very talented and often self-cultivated, unless if they had an in with a family member or some sort of close friend. Like Artemisia with her father. Exactly. Exactly. Now, on top of all of that, there's kind of a black hole of judicial history, if that makes sense, um, between really the mid 1500s and the mid 1700s. So exactly the time we're looking at, I couldn't find a whole lot on on what's going on. And part of that is because of this turmoil and tension between what is ecclesiastical or run by the church and what is run by the state, the sovereign state. Secular. And secular. Exactly. And Part of that is the Pope that is in charge during basically the duration of our story, Pope Paul V. He is a little bit of a controversial figure. And as soon as he gets into power, he almost starts a civil war, a war between the states. And I should mention at this point, Italy isn't unified. It's made up of different city states and each one is its own sovereign nation. It wouldn't become a unified country as we know it 
for another 270 odd years, 1870 is when it is officially unified, which is a lot later than most people think. So fun fact for you there, if you didn't mm-hmm. know that one, uh, might, might get it right on a Jeopardy question or something. There you go. <laughs> um, Rip Alex Trebek. I know, I know. Um, so yeah, they weren't unified yet. So although Rome is the center of the Catholic Church, that is basically what connects all of these different city states, as well as other countries in Europe at this point. But he almost starts a civil war because of this whole tension between ecclesiastical law and secular law. Um, So that's a big issue. On top of that, he decides to ban English Catholics from taking the oath of allegiance or obedience to King James I. He censored Galileo and banned Copernicus's teaching. So this is the whole heliocentric theory that the earth goes around the sun and not the sun goes around the earth. Mm -hmm. He bans all of that. Can't, of can't learn it. That's not good stuff. Yeah, you don't want to keep that out of here. You don't want to be you doing fill people's he- heads with these kind of ideas. Yeah. So he's the one responsible. The earth is flat. And you know what? Even today, like, how proud are we that everyone has cast off these ridiculous thoughts and, and you know, everyone's on the same page and <laughs> science has come so far. Anyway. The flat earthers are going to come for us on Twitter. You know what? Come at me, bro. Like, I don't even... <laughs> I don't even want to talk about that. (laughs) That's what I think about flat earthers. Copernicus could figure it out all of these years ago. Why can't we know? You have you carrying around a computer in your pocket, and you still think the Earth is flat? I mean, come on. But you can't see the curvature from an airplane. Jesus Christ! (laughs) (laughs) Who's the? Was it Bob who thinks who's a flat earther? Who's Bob? He did the airplane song. Oh. uh, Haley Williams. Oh, I remember airplanes in the night sky. Yeah, that guy thinks the Earth is flat. D- is he around anymore? No. There you go. <laughs> well, I mean, he is, but you so know, he has bigger problems. <laughs> <laughs> but he thinks, yeah. obviously, in an in an uh, effort to become relevant, um, <laughs> thinks that the Earth is flat. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so on top of that, this Pope um, considered further crusades, and we all love a good crusade. That is. Mm-hmm. It's a really pleasant way to bring people into the fold. (laughs) (laughs) Let's just kill a bunch of people and do it in the name of Jesus. There you go. Um, And he encourages missionary work. And all of this is to amass huge wealth for his own family. Sure. Huge wealth, which is, it just goes against pretty much everything. No, that's the whole point. (laughs) (laughs) Well, he did a good job because his family is- saving souls and saving cash. Yeah. His family is still wealthy today. (laughs) Still, oh, like, millions and millions and millions of dollars wealthy. Didn't you say that one of his ancestors is on The Bachelor? bachelor. He was on The Bachelor recently. I think it was season nine. Wow. So he was The Bachelor. I don't know if he was. I don't know. I don't watch The Bachelor, I, so I don't so, know if he was The Bachelor. Or, or if it was, was one on of those, The Bachelorette? It because, said The Bachelor when I looked him up. So if he's... Wow. Let's look up The Bachelor season nine. Because he was on the list of most wealthy bachelors. Oh. Oh, apparently we're on like season 24. So this was quite a while ago. (laughs) Um, Yes, 2006. Yeah, he was the bachelor. All right. We're way off track. But anyway, (laughs) so this family has still amassed a ton of wealth. And that's kind of the ruling class, especially, I mean, Artemisia is in Rome. Mm -hmm. So her entire life is dictated by what the church thinks. We'll zero in on Artemisia. Yeah, let's get into Artemisia. So that's what she's living in. It's a very conform a very restrictive society restrictive society based on gender roles yeah and same same song and dance different backdrop Mm -hmm. so the genileshi family lived in campo marzio the fourth rion or district of rome heavily populated campo marzio was home to a wide range of social classes including aristocrats artists and most of rome's sex workers so i think it could safely be categorized as a red light district now per the elizabeth s cohen article she pointed out that as a young unmarried woman living in this district artemisia had some contradictory expectations about her behavior to navigate wherever she went because wherever she went people expected different things from young unmarried women Artemisia's mother died in 1605, and her father, the painter, Orazio Gentileschi, was left to navigate the upbringing of Artemisia and her younger siblings. Roman fathers were responsible for finding suitable husbands, generating the appropriate dowry, 
and guarding the chastity of their daughters. So Orazio realized that Artemisia needed a mother figure to guide her through the rest of the perils of young womanhood. He sought the help of a married neighbor named Tuzia to act as a surrogate. Tuzia's job consisted of being Artemisia's chaperone when in the company of suitors. This is the guarding her chastity part. But by the sound of it, Artemisia's teenage years were anything but typical. Orazio's career as a painter exposed Artemisia to the craft at a young age. In fact, Orazio taught all of his children to paint, but Artemisia was clearly the most gifted and talented. That was very apparent early on. She helped her father with his work in an apprentice-like capacity. She finished some of his paintings and even completed whole works. She completed her first signed painting. So the first one she put her name on was called Susanna and the Elders, and she completed that in 1610. So as a teenager, she ran in the same artistic circles as her father. She was a student of painting. She was young and incredibly talented, vivacious, and by all accounts, a very beautiful woman. She spent a lot of time with fellow painters because she would have needed to study other painters, and this included a man named Agostino Tassi. Now, Agostino Tassi was a friend of her father's. He was also a co-worker. They were working on a project in Rome together at the time. Agostino Tassi, and we'll just call him henceforth known as Tassi, uh, he was a master liar and manipulator. Like, Tassi wasn't even his real name. He came from poverty, and through skillful painting and well-placed lies, he was able to weasel his way into Rome under the guise that he was part of a respected family by the name of Tassi. Um, so this guy wasn't even who he said he was. And um, not to focus too much on him too early, he has a, a history of what he does to Artemisia. And we'll get into that. One morning in May, of 1611, Agostino Tassi came to the Ginaleshi home and visited Artemisia in her studio. According to Tuzia, her chaperone, he was courting Artemisia, and though Artemisia was often a little too flirty with him for, for Tuzia's taste, it wasn't outside the bounds of normal courtship behavior. Another story is that Tuzia just let Tassi in through her apartments to see Artemisia and ultimately betrayed Artemisia. Tassi apparently asked Tuzia to leave them alone. And so being a great freaking chaperone was like, okay, and went to her rooms and left them in the studio alone. Tassi reportedly said he was restless. He wanted to take a turn about the room with Artemisia. And as they're walking around the studio, there happened to be an open bedroom door that he shoved her inside and locked the door. Tassi shoved Artemisia down on the bed and raped her. Ar- Artemisia fought him, but he outweighed her. And so she wasn't able to wriggle out from under him until he released her. Artemisia reportedly went to a drawer, grabbed a knife, and started to you know, go at him. She tried to stab him with it. And he responded by holding open his shirt in a taunting fashion, saying, come at me, see what you can do. She managed to draw blood, but didn't really do any real damage. And apparently Tassi was surprised to find out that she was a virgin. And when he, when he, when she said this, he attempted to, or he, he tried to appease her. He said that he would marry her. Um, and she agreed. Uh, It's important to note at this moment, the concept of rape, the crime committed against against Artemisia was not the act of having sex with her against her will. In the eyes of the law at this point, the crime committed against her was the act of taking her maidenhead, taking her virginity. If she had just been someone who had been well known of having sexual relationships, there wouldn't have been a thing that she could do about it. Um, But. Uh, she agreed to, to marry him. You know, he, he's going to repair the honor that he sullied. And for the next few months, Artemisia slept with Tassi. They had a sexual relationship, as would have been not out of the ordinary for a betrothed couple. So not outrageous. It sounds outrageous. Well, and it's important to note as well, this is a transaction. Yeah. Artemisia is going to be raised in a society that views marriage and sex as transactional. Well, let's let's go into this. So in Rome, there are several possible avenues for families to take after the loss of a maidenhead. There are really three main avenues to take to restore the lost honor. Okay, the first one and the most um, 
advantageous for the family was the rapist marries the victim. So thus he broke the hymen. He's buying the girl and the financial responsibility to put it crassly. Okay? How horrendous yeah. is that? I mean, we, we talk about rape culture today. This is the norm for yeah. when this happens. Right. And this option is the easiest option for the girl's family because it could be done quietly. And the rest of the world never had to know that the daughter's honor had been impugned. The second option is the rapist pays money for the girl's dowry. Okay. Again, since he t- the rapist took the maidenhead, he has now devalued the girl in the marriage market. So she is not as valuable because she's not a virgin. But to make up for the lost chastity, he can pump up the dowry so she can marry a prominent person or at least make up for the fact um, that she's not a virgin. So a prominent family could forgive a girl's sullied honor, but for a price. Okay. The third and 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 least desirable option, because it would it would be so public, and that's exactly what we're about to talk about here, is the girl's father can take the rapist to court under the charge of stuprum. And stuprum is basically rape of a virgin. And as a result, the court court placed heavy emphasis on establishing the girl's reputation for without confirmation of her virginity. She had absolutely no case. Now, a side note, a few months before he raped Artemisia, Tassi was also brought up on charges of incest for raping his sister-in-law, but these never came to fruition. He was charged with incest and not rape because she was already, quote, wedded and bedded. So she wasn't a virgin. She couldn't technically be raped, which I think is really hard for me to wrap my brain around. Well, couldn't by law. Right. According to the law, that is not a rape. That is incest because she's a family member. Well, and think of the mental burden this is placing on women as well. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, we know in today's society how hard it is for people to come forward and report this. And it is a crime when it isn't a crime and you're being told that it doesn't matter that it happened to you. You know, I think something that was really interesting that Cohen, Elizabeth Cohen was talking about in her article, she made a point to distinguish a difference between how we as like 21st century women would view rape. You know, that's a violation of our personhood. You know, feminism is is centered around this idea that a woman's sexuality, and her body is her own. Right. Um, but to put it to paraphrase her in. 17th century Italy, the violation is is the devaluation of the woman in the marriage market, that it wouldn't have necessarily been this psychological trauma. It's what have you done to my life because you've devalued me because my my virginity was a currency. I was going to pay with that for a respectable marriage, which is so. Yeah. And I think I mean. Obviously, that's not the whole case, because with Artemisia, we'll see as the story progresses, that's obviously how she's been raised Mm -hmm. to think. And that's how the society around her thinks. Mm -hmm. But we can see through her art after this has happened to her that it is very psychological, that it's taken a very heavy toll on her for the rest of her life. So whether the law says so or not, that psychological, whether the law says so or not, whether the time period she's living in says so or not. It's still taken the same psychological burden. Well, we we infer we infer that based on the subject matter of her later paintings. Right. We mm. haven't she didn't necessarily write it down. No, that's but the fact true. of the matter is and we'll get into this. But the fact of the matter is she spends 40 years painting paintings of women cutting the heads off of rapists. So I would say she's pretty upset we, about it. I think we could infer that, that it had a, a deep psychological impact on her. And it happened, I mean, this happened one year after she painted her first official work. So this is at the birth of her, of her career. And all the more reason why what happens next happens, okay? So because she, Artemisia, agreed to the marriage, it appears that she goes with this first option. Atasi was a, an artist. He was probably, he had a patron. He was probably a pretty decent um, uh, a pretty decent suitor, or at least a a pretty decent candidate. Okay, despite the fact that he's a liar, he's already married, <laughs> he's he's raped his sister in law. He's still, you know, he's still a man of of prominence with a a decent reputation in the art world. So she's she's still entertaining it, right? 
So the relationship, their sexual relationship continues for a few months. And nine months after the a rape actually happened, the rape happened in May of 19, or, uh, of 1611, uh, her father, Orazio, petitioned Pope Paul V to bring formal t- charges against Tassi. So why the lag time? All right. Well, number one, Artemisia agreed to marry him. And we know he, they, they had to know that, that he was already married because Artemisia, well, when he proposed marriage, he was like, basically, when I get out of this crazy conundrum that I'm in, I'll make you my wife and make up for the lost virginity and all that. And so they continue having their relationship. But somewhere along the line, something goes wrong. Um, but it is important to know. Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, although the word relationship is being used, I, I just find a problem with that. I don't know how to like. No, I completely uh, agree. Illiterate. It's, I know it's, it's, it's not what you're no. saying. It's this, this is, is not what a healthy ha- situation. Yeah. This is the wording that's being used to describe it. Is right. It's a relationship between these two that is progressing from the point of rape onwards. But what started it was an act of violence. Right. And so every act after that is tainted by the act of violence that it began with. I completely agree with you. And by our modern sensibilities, that makes complete sense. This is an abuser, abusey relationship, Mm -hmm. abuser, victim relationship. So I just wanted to throw that out there because I know I know what we're talking about. I just wanted to make sure everyone knows what we're talking about. Absolutely. Yeah, I am not. No, no, I know you are. No, 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 no. But I think this also the, the point that Cohen made in her article about looking at this like we're talking about this in a very transactional way. And it's important to note that even when the trial begins in 1512, for the first six weeks of the trial, Orazio and Tassi are still negotiating an out of court settlement that included marriage to Artemisia. Basically, they go to trial and only virgins could be raped. And as a result, the court placed a heavy emphasis on establishing the girl's reputation. For without confirmation of this, she had absolutely no case. The most advantageous defense for a defendant was to claim the girl wasn't a virgin, which is exactly what Tassi did. He painted her as a wild party girl who was trying to seduce him and that he was just him. He was he was trying to protect her honor. So that's why he was so obsessed with her and and hanging out with and following her around the city and all this stuff, because by all accounts, Tassi was obsessed with her to the point of annoyance. Um, But again, he was a supposedly a, you know, somebody who could possibly be considered a suitor. So they put up with it. Um, but the court had several ways of determining if a girl was telling a truth about was telling the truth about her chastity. One, look for witnesses to corroborate the girl's condition after the rape Two, drag the victim and her rapist into court face to face to have it out as the magistrate watches and then determines who is lying. And three, judicial torture, put the girl under torture in the court of law to see if she changes her story. And that's exactly what happens. Mind you, not the rapist to make sure that he's telling the truth. The girl. The girl. Okay. So that's exactly what happens. So to to find out if she was lying or not, which according to Cohen, that this would have been something that was encouraged by the people on her side. Quote, officials sympathetic to the Ginaleshi claim adopted torture to strengthen their case. The ritualized pain validated her claims. So Artemisia was put under thumbscrews for several minutes uh, for the good of her honor. And apparently this did satisfy the court because no more mind was paid to Tassi's Tassi's claims that she was a harlot, basically. Uh, But the trial does last seven months and it's incredibly embarrassing um, for the for the family, which is a risk, which is a lot of the times why that that was like the last option was to take the rapist to court. Um, because it was so embarrassing and it would have just been all over the place. It was a highly publicized trial and the court documents were taken. They were meticulously taken, um, which is why we know so much about this, or at least people who can read Italian. It's just why they know so much about them. Uh, but after the seven month trial, the magistrate found that Tassie was guilty. One source uh, I found said that he spent two years in prison after this. Um, but I Cohen, who did a, has done a fantastic job covering this in this article and has done what I can from what I can tell at least 10 incredibly meticulous articles about 
Rome and and you know what what's happening at this time i'm gonna go ahead and trust her and she said that nothing basically nothing happened um he was found guilty and he was sentenced to be banished from rome but he didn't leave and within a couple years his patrons had leaned on the magistrates who just eventually threw out the verdict and his record was like essentially expunged i believe um but there was that nothing happened to him he wasn't even made to leave rome um but so artemisia you know this it went in her favor but but she's the one who ends up leaving. She is because like within a month of the conclusion of the trial, she married uh, the brother of one of her character witnesses because, you know, of course, you have to have character witnesses to prove that you're not a harlot or a strumpet, you know. And um, she married Pietros Antonio de Stiatisi, brother of her main character witness. Uh, they left Rome like hot minute later. Um, for Florence. I believe he was from Florence. He was a Florentine. Together, they had at least one surviving daughter, but the marriage didn't last very long. They split pretty soon after that. And so Artemisia maintained a household on her salary as a painter. Well, and they only had the one surviving daughter, but they did have, I think it was up to five kids Mm -hmm. before they split. Which was all pretty rapidly because they were only together for about six years. She did take a lover as well. She Don't did forget. take a lover. Named Francesco Maria Mar... Marangi? <laughs> Francesco Maria Maringi. Maringi? Maringi. All right. I can't roll my R's. Maringi. There we go. There we go. And she wrote a ton of letters to him. And this is a really important point in her life because all throughout the trial, something that they mention is that she's illiterate. Mm -hmm. And she likely was until she gets to Florence. And this bitch teaches herself how to read and write. Check it out. Like, love it. Great. Yeah. And in doing so, she'll also read like all of the great poets and literature of the day. And she writes these long, beautiful letters. Well, I assume they're beautiful. I can't read Italian. (laughs) (laughs) But the Met, the Metropolitan Museum has an exhibit of some of these letters. Mm -hmm. So I got some snippets from there. Now, on top of all of this, so starting her own studio, raising all of her kids, um, losing several children, which is tragedy all in itself, mm-hmm. losing her husband, getting mad at her lover. Um, she also is hired as an official court painter, which is a massive thing in this time period because it means she gains a patron and mm-hmm. she gains patronage of the Medici family. Which is a really big deal. Massive. I mean, they basically invented banks. Sure. So this is huge um they are you know one of the wealthiest families for years and years and years and years Mm -hmm. in europe and yeah she's doing great now the subject of her paintings it's interesting her first painting which take you know obviously happens before she's attacked is interesting in its subject material because Susanna is a is a biblical reference, but essentially she's falsely accused of sleeping with people other than her husband and accused the, of adultery. Yeah, accused of adultery and people try and blackmail her into get this, sleeping with them so they won't expose her to the public. So tell me how that works. But anyway, she refuses to go along with their plan and is convicted of adultery. And that meant death in the time period that we're looking at. Again, this is a biblical story. But of course, some man steps in and like saves the day or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's the subject of her first painting, which I think is interesting because then the subject of her paintings afterwards changes to where women are saving themselves from these situations. Mm -hmm. So her most recognizable paintings are of Judith slaying Holofernes, which we talked about earlier on. And Judith's story is really interesting. She has her own book in the Bible that's not included in any modern printings. No, right? it's it's included in some Orthodox Old Testaments, depending on which religion we're looking at. But it has been cut along with, well, many books that were written by or narrated by women. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's interesting because, um, I mean, one of the most well-known, I would argue, most well-known stories in the Bible is the story of Moses, mm-hmm. right? And I know this is seeming like it's going way off topic, but I think this is important. We'll come back. Yep. To we're talk coming about back. <laughs> we're taking the long way around. We're taking the long way around. Everyone kind of has an idea of Moses. 
this whole like hand Parting of God of idea sea and all that. Yes. Tablets, lightning. Yeah, yeah. To save his people. Judith does a similar thing without any supernatural help. She does it just her. Mm -hmm. So she doesn't need any parting of the Red Sea. She doesn't need any God-given plagues. She just follows her heart, essentially. And her heart leads her to help overcome this enemy, Mm -hmm. in a sense. And it's a very real enemy. She's Her community is faced with Holferne's army. And they want to, I guess, invade. And it's supposed to be this big threat to Christianity. And there's a lot more to this story. It's in two parts. There's a whole thing. And I'm trying to get my hands on it because I'm kind of interested in reading yeah. it not paraphrased. And so no one wants to do anything in her community. They're like, we're just going to have to let it pass, see what happens. Whatever happens, happens. And she's mm-hmm. like, no, we can't just sit here and passively let Holfernes and his army take over. We have to do something. And she decides to take the matter into her own hands. She infiltrates the army, eventually making her way up to Holfernes. And she's like, hey, I'm going to be a spy. That's how she does this. And she feeds them some bogus information. And there's two versions of how the story goes once she meets Holfernes. One is that she tries to seduce him. And the other, which is more likely the version of this story that Artemisia Artemisia is going to be familiar with, is that he tries to attack her and rape her. And in retaliation, Judith is ready. She cuts his head off with the help of her mate, who is also with her. All right. And that is what we're seeing her portray. And there are several other paintings that Artemisia does of this story, um, including one where there's the guy's head in a basket. There's also uh, Judith with his head on a platter to show to her people to be like, hey, look, idiots, (laughs) I did this. And then the enemy has retreated and they have gone because they don't know what to do with me. Yeah. So you want something done, you got to do it yourself. Exactly. And she didn't need anyone to part any seas for her. There you go. So that is a big subject of Artemisia's work. But she also focuses on other women that have overcome obstacles in their own life. You also see her depict Lucretia, who we talked about with our Boudicca Mm -hmm. episode. And Lucretia also was attacked. And she has her husband and several soldiers kind of get revenge for her. And essentially, it's what triggers the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Now, she depicts Lucretia in a moment right before she commits suicide. And all of that pain and anger and fear is, is depicted very well in that painting. And I'm sure it's something... Artemisia felt. I mean, you you can see it in in the painting. I, I don't know how to exactly explain it. Well, you can. I mean, art art is a a visceral. It's a it's a feeling. You feel art. It's, sometimes it's just really hard to put into words. It's you feel it. Yeah, and I would say even if you didn't know the subject of this painting, looking at it, you can get a sense of that. So she is very good at portraying those emotions because she is going through them herself. She focuses a lot of her art on the pain and anger felt after a violent attack like Mm -hmm. she's experienced. Right. And she also paints a lot of herself. There's a lot of self-portraits of her doing perfectly normal things like playing the lute. (laughs) So all of her art wasn't focused on that, but she does channel, I would say, a lot of her pain and anguish into this. And we see her use her herself as the model for some of these women as almost I would say like a way to see herself in these stories and see a different outcome than what she's experienced because really I mean what kind of justice has she gotten I mean the only justice that she was that that the court afforded her was kind of a patched together reputation and she married so quickly right after the trial I think they did that to salvage her reputation because I don't think she would have been a, been able to go any further with her art career had the society viewed her as a solely girl who couldn't get a husband. I don't think she would have been able to be as impactful as she was. I don't know. Maybe I, she kicked him to the curb pretty quick. I don't know. I think it would be it's different for a, a woman who was already married and had children and all that. And then they just split versus like being a, a solid virgin, for lack of a better term. And trying to have a life. 
Yeah, I mean, the patronage and everything else, because she leaves. I think that's that says quite a lot. It's really she important. Leaves, she leaves Rome. She leaves. Yeah. And she does build a very successful career for herself. Some of the other letters that we have from her later on in her life are mostly business letters where she's you know, writing to and from patrons and potential buyers and things like that. And one letter, I think, really sums her up well. She describes herself as the spirit of Caesar and the soul of a woman. There you go. I love that self-esteem. Yeah. That's some high self-esteem right there. It is. I wish well, I had that self-esteem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, her. she deserved it. Absolutely. Yeah. And there's a couple of other letters that are talking about, like, I'm worth the price you're paying. Like, once you see it, you'll know. Yeah. And she just won't back down. Like, she does not back down on prices because she's a woman. There are some, like, big insults from these people who are wanting art. Mm -hmm. And it's, I mean, it's the same thing we see, like, creators come up with now. Like, oh, you're a small artist, so why don't you give me a discount or yeah. whatever? She's like, nope, I'm worth it. So, bye. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, final question here. Do you think... Artemisia is defined by her sexuality, and does this overshadow her achievements? I wouldn't say it overshadows her achievements, but I, and I wouldn't say she's necessarily defined by it. I think she explores it through her artwork. Don't you think that it's interesting that if she were trying to downplay that, obviously, this would have been a story that followed her. Mm -hmm. And if she were trying to downplay it, it wouldn't have been the best choice to paint things like put her face on Judith, cutting the head off of her would be racist, rapist or modeling herself in these, you know, in the paintings of the same vein. I mean, that's that's keeping it alive. Right. Absolutely. And it's interesting because she does do a couple of renditions of the Virgin Mary and child. Mm -hmm. But those are not the paintings that she's known for. And, I mean, now I think it's a really something that feminists are fascinated with because you have a victim of rape who came became this incredible artist who already was an incredible artist but like who's able to foster this amazing career and still be revered in art history books you know several hundred years later um, but I think modern feminists really want to talk about you know the kind of she's like the phoenix rising from the ashes I would say though I mean that first subject the first subject she picks for her painting even though it's Daniel coming to the rescue there's still a woman in turmoil. There's an element of that already in her work. Mm -hmm. And I think it was amplified by what happens to her. And unfortunately, I mean, we've spent this whole episode. She is now defined by that one incident that what less than a year in her life of being attacked, going through this trial and everything else. But Really, it's her art. I, I, again, you said at the beginning, you never knew the story looking at the painting. Mm -hmm. And once you only found out once when you, you start digging, all of a sudden, this is like the defining thing that we talk about. And also, it's probably because it was so well documented. Mm -hmm. I mean, think the the court yeah. transcripts. I mean, you're going to your eyes going to go to where there's evidence and there's evidence there. So, I mean, yeah, unfortunately, because of record keeping and not having anything else really other than, you know, her letters. That is like what people can read and know the most about in her life, I think. Well, does that make, let me ask you this, does that make the painting more impactful for you now, knowing her history? Or was it always just as impactful? Well, I, I think there's symbolism behind it. I, I mean, that is so powerful to, after you go through this whole ordeal, you're tortured in open court to confirm that you're a virgin. This thing goes on for seven months. I mean, think about the gossip and the comments and all the stuff that she would have had to go through. This would have been, I imagine, a pretty trim like no matter what the social norms were that at the time, this would have been a really traumatic experience. Um, and I think that knowing that and then seeing that she paints herself as the model in these characters, that absolutely makes it more impactful. Because I didn't know that was her face. I mean, what other reason would you have for doing that other than to either maybe she's expressing herself, maybe she's it, doing it therapeutically to free herself, th that this is what I would do if I could do it because he didn't receive this punishment? Well, and think about it. She did try. She tried to stab him. Yeah. And so it's almost a I failed at doing this, mm -hmm. but other people have not. And so if I can 
put myself in those shoes, it gives me that little bit of power back. Right. Yeah. I just think there's a lot more, I think there's a lot more to it psychologically. If you look at the paintings and, and the fact, like just the sheer fact that she puts her face in there, that to me. But then again, I'm not, I'm not an art historian. I don't know. Is that, that is that typical? It depends on who you're looking Cause if at. Because if you just need a model, you need a face, and you're like, I have a nice face. I'm just going to like plop something in there. But honestly, a lot of artists would hire models. Right. And it, it's not every painting she does, but it's in there if you compare them to her self-portrait. But anyway, this was super interesting, <laughs> and I'm glad that we talked about it. Mm-hmm. Anything else to add? Not right now, no. Well, folks, we hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, I want you to head to your favorite podcasting platform and leave us a five-star review. It has been a little dry out there. We need some reviews, okay, people? And um, we'll read them out on our next our next episode, if that's your fancy. I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> But anyway, Jasmine, what about social stuff? Social stuff. So follow us on Twitter at the Good OD Pod and on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok at the Good Old Days Pod. And yeah, follow us, keep up with us. We're posting videos and tweets and all sorts of stuff that we're working on. So hope to see you on there. Don't forget, you can get all of our episodes early and ad-free at patreon.com slash thegoodolddayspod. That's patreon.com slash thegoodolddayspod. See you next week. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.